and we can start. Please. So, hello everybody. Um, well, I think most of you know me, so I'm not sure whether an introduction is in order or needed. So, um, I will just start the presentation as is, and then let's see. Right, okay, so today's talk is about high-performance SMR drives with the DM7. Um, you probably are bored to death about SMR drives already, because um, this seems to be... <laughs> Shut up. Sorry, that was a comment uh, for the comment in the talk. Um, so, um, SMR drives are, in fact, the shingled magnetic recording drives, as they're called. And... Um, so they are basically a way where the hard drive vendors are trying to get more capacity out of existing drives um, without having to increase the size or the density of the uh, of the platters themselves. Um, they do have they, the biggest thing about SMR drives is that they are organized in zones, meaning regions on the disk. Um, which are actually visible to the outside world and to the user. These zones have two types, come in two types. That's one is the random access zone, which be, uh, within which the drive will just behave like a normal drive and you can write and read to it just like a normal drive. And then there's this other thing called sequential write zone, which allows you to read just like normal. Random reads are perfectly possible, but writes have to be strictly sequential. That is, um, well, quite uh, quite surprising for any, for the unsuspecting file system, um, but more to that later. Also, the number of sequential write zones are substantially higher than the number of random access zones, because, well, the sequential write zones are precisely that, where the SMR drives get its, gets its capacity from, because using sequential writes, it allows the um, drive manufacturer to squeeze more data into the same in the same area than previously. So, um, when we want to put a file system on these drives, um, things become slightly tricky as your classical regular file system assume random access pattern and they assume they can read and write anywhere on the disk wherever they like. So, this is clearly not going to work with SMR drives, especially not in the sequential write zones. And hence, you would need to do some modification such that file system can work natively on SMR drives. And as usual with these modifications, they do take really, really a long time to be deployed in the field. And as it turns out, they even take a long time to be developed. So the, there is a patch set for ButterFS such that ButterFS can work natively on SMR drives. But this patch set has just been posted, has been posted, I think, a few weeks ago. And the initial implementation has started around a year ago, or even more. So it really took quite some time for that to get developed. And now it's it's been posted and it looks good so far, but still has been merged into the upstream code and obviously not in any distribution at this time. So it really takes a long time for these things to be um, available in the field. And of course, it all it also assuming that the file system can be modified. For some file system, it turns out to be really, really tricky, if not impossible, to modify them to work in SMR drives. For example, ext4. So, and to make this a bit a bit easier. Um, Damien from Western Digital has written a device mapper module called DM Sound, which allows the SMR drives to be used like uh, just like a normal a normal random access drive. Um, what it does, it it acts a bit like a write cache, uh, in in that it's using the random access zones to cache the data, and then copy the um, assembled data from these random access zones over to the sequential write zones. With that, we do get an internal remapping for zones, so such that the LB, the logical LBAs from DM zones only have a very, very slant relationship to the actual LBAs where they land on the disk. And in fact, there has a, DM zones is carrying a translation table to figure out which LBA, logical LBA matches to which 
um, physical LBA on the disk. And um, to show you a bit of the um, how the thing works internally, I've done some, some nice, nice graphs here. So um, this is the top one is uh, the logical zones or the logical box. And the bottom one is the actual physical drive um, partitioned in random access zones and sequential write zones. So if you now start to write into the first block, that's marked in red here. So that's marked in red um, here. Um, first, this whole zone, meaning this zone here, that's the zone, is being registered in the translation table, that's here, that one here, so it's being marked there, and then it's the block itself is being um, written to the, to the first block on that disk, on in that zone. So if we now start with another, with another block on the same zone, same, same thing happened, um, DM sound looks in the translation table, figures out, yeah, we've already written them, that's fine. So it then goes ahead and can write the block to the so to the um, area in the on the disk. So if we now start writing into a different zone, marked here, then again it, it, the translation table is updated, and it's been written to the first free random access zone here with this uh, on the same same block in this random access zone. And if we now start writing um, a new set of, uh, of blocks here, then again, the um, then it, figured, it figures out, oh, well, we can't really write because all the zones here are empty. So it needs to copy over data from this zone here or from the oldest one to somewhere else. So that's what, what, it's, what it's doing now. So it moves the data from the first random access zone over to a sequential, a sequential zone, and then updates the mapping table here, so that, such that the mapping table is now pointing to the sequential write zone. And then we can write this, the data to the now free random access zone. And if the system is idle, meaning if there are no I.O. coming in from, uh, from the upper layers, the uh, DM zone is starting the reclaim, as it's called. So essentially garbage collection to free up random access zones because these are the zones which are, being, which are needed for doing actual I.O. So, and reclaim works just like a previous mapping um, copy out step. So it looks at the oldest, oldest data in a random access zone, copy this over to a sequential zone, and then updates the mapping table here and now we have the free run access zone. And the same works with the, uh, with the, with the uh, first run access zone. It's been copied over to a free a sequential zone. The uh, mapping table is being updated and now all run access zones are free and we can, uh, new IO can come in. And this whole thing is clearly has some tunables because um, it is up to the admin when this reclaim process should be starting. So for that, there are two watermarks, the infamous high and low watermarks. With the high watermark, um, the system will start reclaiming, but will the reclaim will be running at a low speed, hence it will be throttled, so that um, the I.O. bandwidth isn't, isn't taken up and I, normal I.O. won't be affected. Then there's the low water mark, which is the case when we are about to run out of free random access zones, because then we have to start reclaim, otherwise you can't do IO at all. And then clearly we should be writing out a data from the random access zone as fast as possible, such that we can do new IO. The problem with this approach is that um, it doesn't take into account the um, characteristics of the SMR drives, because the problem here is that an SMR drive is actually um, is um, a completely shingle drive. So all it can do is writing to shingle zones, and the random access zones are in fact a software layer on top of a normal um, sequential write zone, which means that the 
performance and the speed with one can read and write to random access zones are actually slower than sequential write zones, uh, which is um, typically not so much a problem, but it's not very, very convenient if you want to use these zones as a cache, because the idea of the cache was that's being faster than the other than, than the other areas. In this case, they are actually slower than writing to sequential zones. So we are actually getting a degrading degrade performance by using the random access zones. And the other issue is that this that the current design only worked with a single drive. And um, well, if you had more than one drive, you would have to um, use a DM zoned um, area for each of, of these drives. So I looked at this and said, hmm, I think we can do better here. Because in the end, um, the random access zones, um, zones are just used, uh, are used as a cache. And as such, there is no strict need for them to be on the same device. So we can as well move them to a different device. I mean, and because in the end, this is device map, but it can map IO or can map LBAs to wherever we like. So we can easily extend or we can extend the whole thing to not use the random access zones as a cache, but a different device as a cache. And the other observation here is that the sequential write zones are actually linear and treated as a linear area. So we can easily just, well, essentially concatenate several devices, several SMR devices, and let the translation layer in DM zone fi figure out where things should be going. Device Mapper already has the necessary, uh, necessary infrastructure al for allowing us to work with several drives. So that is quite easily done from that uh, perspective. And the sound table is already moving I.O. to any unused LBA. So it's just a matter to figure out, all right, on which device is this physical LBA residing? And then everything should be working. And of course, in doing this, we should be able to drive a performance work quite a lot. Because, well, first we can use a, a fast cache, and secondly, we are having several devices to work with. So if everything um, so if everything um, works according to plan, we should be able to leverage the combined performance of the underlying drives. And of course, um, we, it should scale reasonably well, and we can use a really fast cache device like an NVMe or even an NVIDIA. So, and that is what I did. So um, to make this work, I had to update the on-disk metadata because clearly the original metadata would uh, would only cover one de one device, which is which we have to update. On. And um, so I updated the metadata, and um, this turned out a bit more tricky than expected because the original design had not one but two metadata copied to. Um, to ensure consistency, because the metadata is also holding the translation ta table. So this really should be up to date, and we should be ensuring that we get the metadata written completely. Otherwise, you can't really figure out where the I.O. went to. So that's where these two copies came in. So essentially, the first co copy is updated before the I.O., and the second copy is updated after the I.O., and then we are reasonably sure that um, the metadata is written, written correctly. So. Um, when adding more drives, having this metadata design on all drives is not a very clever idea because that would mean we have to write for every I.O. on every drive, um, which is not very good if it comes to performance. So really what we want is carrying the metadata only on the first, namely the cache device, because that's the fast device and we can update metadata quickly there, and use the metadata on the other, the slow drives, only to have information how the device is being assembled. So essentially, I added a third type of metadata, which I call tertiary metadata, which just holds, which looks like just uh, looks like the normal metadata, but they will never be updated in normal during normal operation. They just carry the information where this particular device is is being located in the logical structure. And um, for the ca cache device, I mean. 
when we start using a different device, um, th there is a fair chance that this device is not a sound device because, well, in the end, that was the idea. That's not a sound device because we want to have uh, have a fast device here. And um, but as the DM sound is working on the sounds, um, I, we have to implement and we actually have to emulate sounds on the regular devices. But then, I mean, this is pretty trivial. You just divide it by the size of the sounds, and then then you have your logical sounds on your normal device. So, and this is, um, I hope I can read it properly here. Um, this is how the whole thing looks like. So, this one here is the normal, it's, it's just a single drive. Um, basically, oh yeah, it zooms in. Cool. Did I do that? Hmm. Right. Okay. So, um, this one here is um, the first device, and then here we have the second device. And the... Uh, you can move the uh, scaled image. Yeah, yeah, but that's fine. I mean, you, uh, the whole point of having this is that one can see the entire device. If when I move in, I only see parts of the drive, drive which was kind of, kind of not defeating the purpose here. Anyway, so, and then having implemented all this, which was actually doing lockdown times, and I happened to have a um, a desktop here, a desktop machine here in my home office thing, which you can see behind me. Yeah, home office, um, which was uh, was quite well because it actually were able to host two drives. And I said, yeah, cool. And it had a VDM. So I said, yeah, cool. Use it to, to implement the whole thing. Everything worked nicely. And then I said, yeah, but two drives is mm, not really scaling. So we really want to scale it up a bit more. And then I asked nicely with Western Digital, hey, I want to scale things up. Can we do something? And they said, yeah, sure. How many drives do you need? And so I got two large packets with drives. And then I, I ended up with having about 30 SMR drives, which is nice and very generous. And I used them, I tried to use them for testing. But then the first problem was, right, now I have 30 drives. Which case can actually hold 30 drives? Which remind you, these are three and a half inch drives. So these are the large ones. And your classical server can hold up to eight or, if you're lucky, 12 drives. And then the 2HE server is full. So hmm, this is not going to work. So I looked through the, our server rooms and looked into basically every corner we had and then i discovered some weird hp apollo drive boxes which we got at one point which were actually actually able to host all these drives we just said hey cool so um then i put the drives in everything's nice and proper and started and then it says the hba says yeah right nice that you have drives but i don't like them because they're smr drives and i don't want to play with the smr drives so brilliant so next then was to figure out which HBA to use and try to figure out whether we had one of those HBAs. Luckily enough, in in my stack of unused HBAs, I had one of those, albeit a rather oldish one, but nevertheless, and I used that. Um, but then the next problem was that um, I actually needed to use an NVDEM just to get the required performance for the or the advice, uh, the estimated performance of the whole thing. Because um, testing showed that we will be getting of about, well, 200 max per second of an SMR drive. If you look at a normal NVMe drive, you are ending up with something like 600 max per second, which is nice. But if you want to use the combined bandwidth, that means that you can't put in more than three drives. Otherwise, the bandwidth of our bandwidth of the SMR drive will outperform the bandwidth of a cache device. Again, not going to work. So I actually had to use NVDIMs just, uh, just to get the re required speed. But these four HP books didn't really have NVDIMs. So I needed to use another box and somehow daisy chain this box with the HPA to the HP box. Which, um, well, with the generous help of, of Jack and the um, expense and expensing some cables, um, I actually had been able to do. So I ended up with some tandem thing of one NVIDIA box and a large HP box holding the drives. So um, this was all OK. But then, sadly, the connection was only 6 gig SAS because that's all, the only thing the um, HP box could do. So um, there might be some performance limitations due to um, 
the, uh, the uh, interface limitation. For performance, the actual test I did on yet another HP box, this time with NVIDIA's. That's a 20 core dual socket Xeon with 128 gig RAM, and I used 264 gig NVIDIA's as a cache here. And well, that's the Broadcom HBA, which I had there, and I put in 12 and 12 Western Digital Drives. Actually, there had been 24 Western Digital Drives, but they were on the other channel, which the Broadcom card didn't see. Hmm. OK, I used 12. Let's see. Let's see how the performance goes with 12 drives. New drives. Should be enough for starters. So, and this is the performance I got with two disks, which I found, wow, that's impressive, and actually what I, what I had expected. This here is the cache performance. So when, whenever we have free, free cache zones, this line here is the um, the ratio of free cache zones. So hence it always starts at one because that means all for, all zones are free. And as soon as we have cache zones, performance is pretty nifty. It's about two and a half gig per second. That's the right performance, remember? So hmm, quite impressive. And once uh, we run out of Anas, yes, uh, what is on the x-axis. Well, that that's the uh, number of runs. So I um, did a some sort of FS stress uh, FS stress thing with uh, with FIO. Ah, so I used used FS to, um, FIO um, to run in in directories, and then use several runs such that always it will write into new directories here. So it had about what I think twenty directories and twenty files per directory or something like that. So some mock up FS stress thing. And this started filling up the drive for each run, which means that the performance goes down because you you eventually start um, re reusing up more and more free zones on uh, on the cache device. So that looks quite good. Okay, and then said, all right, put in four disks. Let's see what happens happens with four disk. So and then we said, then I figured, yeah, okay. Still, what we had expected, the cache performance is still good, and the write performance here, once all the zones are used up, are actually higher than um, than in the two drive case because two drives were here, see here, so and four drives was yeah, so mm, with a really broad thumb about double the performance, yeah, that's fine. Only it starts fluctuating here and here too, which is a hmm, that's weird. How come this? Because that's that's writing into the cache here, so it can't really be influenced by the um, by the disk themselves. So that was a bit odd. So hmm, what's going on here? So I put in six drives and see what's happening with six, six drive. Again, performance is up once the um, all zones are used up, and the cache performance is still good. Even but also here hmm, the fluctuation and here and here is getting more noticeable. Hmm, what's going on? So with eight drives, and there we see, oh, hmm, that is now really, really strange here. What is going on? And um, also, and the fluctuation on once we used up all zones is also quite noticeable. But however, what we also find is that the um, free cache zones last longer because if you look here, so say this one here. So um, here where the cache zones are being are used up at around what 80, whatever that is. Let's see, I can click, I can zoom, zoom in here, zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can zoom. Oh, I can't zoom. Maybe. Hmm. I can't zoom. Oh, I can zoom there. All right, that's the wrong button. So now you see. So right, so about 120. Um, after 128 runs, um, we run out of we run out of cache zones, and here it's eight, and with eight drives we are now after one hundred six and one hundred fifty roughly now uh, running out of cache zones, and we also see here that there's an area where the zone DM zone manages to keep the number of free zones at roughly the same level, which incidentally is the low watermark. So it seems that with more drives, the low watermark finally comes into play and allows DM zone to um, hold the number of free caches around the low watermark, which is good because that's what, what it was for. Curious though that it only works with a larger number of disks, but okay, yeah. So and this is now with 10 disks, and there we can see 
the area, uh, the, uh, the range where the low watermark works is even longer. Consequently, the um, area where the cache zones can be used is even extended even more. And also that we are not seeing anything here about the, um, about the actual performance once the disk zones are used up. And what we also see is that the fluctuations in the cache zone when cache zones are used is quite high. Um, so, and this is now with 12 disks, and there we see fluctuation, and we're not even using up all zones here. Okay, so first result is yes, we're getting a reasonably good cache performance of, our, of around 200 gig gigabytes per second. Um, there's a drop in performance once all cache zones are, are used, but yeah, of course, I mean, that's expected because then we have to run to disk and that clearly will go into the performance. And um, that performance, once all zones are used up, actually, well, goes up with the number of disks. So that's what we expected. It doesn't actually scale as such with the number of disks, um, but then we can't really me measure reliably how much the performance goes up because we do have a quite high fl a fluctuation in performance. So, and this is now a graph where all the um, all the various um, number of, of disks are, are being plotted on, two, on top of each other, such that you can see, all right, how is the scaling really with the number of disks? So what we can see is that we are using up that the um, range after which the um, zones are being used up is moving outwards, as you would expect with the number of, of, um, of disks. The initial, at least the initial write performance is constant uh, and does not depend on the number of disks, which is again what we would expect. But what we did not really expect is that the fluctuation increased with the number of disks. And um, now, and another thing which also which we also had expected, or was what was the general idea, is that um, we can leverage the combined bandwidth of the um, of the drives if we have more than one drive. Um, the scalability isn't well hard to figure out because the um, fluctuation is really, is quite high in these areas. Yeah, there's, so, a comment, there's a comment. Yes, um, fast enough when the time. I mean, the last one about. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, yes, so seems natural. So, yes, I did actually expect that the reclaim would be working more efficiently because that was kind of the idea um, of using this whole thing. Um, I did hope, though, that the um, reclaim mechanism would even work with the lower number of disks, but then this turned out not to be the case. So apparently that the disks weren't, um, what, weren't slow enough, weren't fast enough, I don't know. So this is something which still needs to be um, analyzed further. So this here is now the cache scalability. Um, basically, what, what I've plotted here is the number of um, the area where the and the zone is able to keep the number of free zone at free zones at the low watermark level, and what you can see here, essentially what, what John sa Jan said, is that the um, low watermark mechanism is getting more and more efficient the more disks we have. Yeah, it's uh, hello, uh, hi. Um... Hannes. So yeah. one idea. Uh, so what is strange are really those fluctuations. It seems like yeah. that simply when, like, are, the reclaim is somehow. That. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We are getting to that. I'm not. I still have more slides. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. We are getting to that. Um, dum, 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 dum. So. So what we do have is a slight uh, performance degradation. So of about one dot one dot five percent in cache only performance um, with a number of disks. Which is yeah about about to be expected because um, reclaim is started for each and every I/O, and so if we have more more reclaim workers because the reclaim workers are per disk, um, the more workers need to be start uh, are potentially started. So there will be some some slight um, performance interaction with the number of disks. And but in overall, it guides reasonably well. 
So that's the reclaim scalability, essentially the same graph than I did previously. So we, we do see that the number of um, um, the, the ratio of um, reclaim zones is getting larger with the number of so of drives. So, um, so which essentially means that reclaim becomes more aggressive with the higher number of drives. Um, which is basically what you just said, Jan, Jan, that we then have more bandwidth to write out data. So reclaim it can it can be more efficient as it simply has more space to work, uh, more more free bandwidth to work on. So and with higher discounts, we the drop in performance moved out of the graph so we haven't been able to register it with uh, beyond 10 disks and with protests we haven't even used all cache zones which means that we really should retest with um with a, with a higher number of runs just to see how the scalability is with higher with a higher drive count which is what i did and here's the performance graph of 12 disks with the double number of round uh, of runs here so we do see the performance just just like before quite high fluctuations here um reclaim working here and then we run out of zones and then the performance drops quite noticeable and we do have a quite high fluctuation here where we occasionally do get really good performance but occasionally we get really really bad performance so um yeah fluctuations here are really really high so why um the there are several things which could work uh, could, could um tie into this the one is that as mentioned um this was a single hba connected to is a six gig sars link so six gig sars is nominally about 600 megabyte per second but then as these are four lanes they should be able to carry about 2.5 gigabytes per second um if and how the hba does it internally clearly i have no idea and i can only hope it does it right so it might be that we have a performance impact from there the other thing is that it's all driven by the same hba and this hba has a limited number of tags meaning the limit a limited number of commands which can execute concurrently which might impact here because if we're having 12 drives this number of tags has to be divided by 12 and then cutting down by quite a lot. So this might be, uh, so we might run into tag starvation problem here. The other thing is what we might be suffering from is NUMA effects. As you um, might remember from the initial description, this is actually a two socket machine. And the NVDEM out of necessity is only connected to a single socket because well, it's a physical NVDEM uh, and it has to be connected to a uh, to one cache by, to a one memory bus which also means that it's all fine if we access the nvdim from the socket where it's being connected to but if we access it from the other socket we actually have to go across the numa link to get to that nvdim which clearly will drive down performance if we use it uh, that other uh, cpu so to test things out I've restricted the, um, the the FIO run to CPUs on the socket which are connect which is connected to the NVIDIA, and suddenly we do get a really really good performance here. So suddenly we are up to two and a half gigs, and yeah. And as a comparison, here this is the FIO run when connect when running on the off socket CPUs. And as you see, the performance drops by half, which is quite surprising, I thought. But then um, knowing that this is NVIDIA, I'm actually not surprised that uh, things are very, very, that the performance is horrible here if you, if you don't ask it nicely. And the problem here is that the reclaim worker is, as the name implies, is, is just a normal worker, which is being queued via a normal work queue mechanism on, well, really any given CPU. So currently we don't have any means of restricting the reclaim worker to run only on the CPU where the NVIDIA is connected. 
And that might account for quite some fluctuation here because if the reclaim worker is running on the wrong CPU, it also means that the, oh, that is nice, Michal, where did you get that from? Hoo -hoo. Anyway, um, so, and this might explain um, something why we are having such a high fluctuation, because that might be the reclaim worker running on just the wrong CPU, whereas IO to that, um, to the to these zones is running on the other CPU. And hence we have a cache bouncing back and forth and then PDM performance goes down. And of course, the other one is write amplification. Because, well, as, we, as we're caching things, we do have a write amplification. Because we do have to write the data once into the cache, then someone, the reclaim worker, has to read them from the cache and write them off to the, um, to the sequential zones. So worst case, we're having three I.O. for one single incoming I.O., which is hmm, quite a lot, actually. And here, as you can see, uh, hopefully, um, I plotted the write amplification. Um, the write amplification here is now actually is the ratio, meaning how many I.O. I have to do. I, I, I have to do. And as you can see, when the performance drops, the write amplification goes up because that means it's not only that we having to write I.O., but we are also having to flush data out. So we are actually using double the bandwidth here in this case to write out data, which would explain why we are having a um, why, why we are having such a large drop. And this is now here the thing for Ford is that becomes even more noticeable. This is not only that we are having to write data, but we're also having to flush our data, flush our data here and thereby um, drag down the performance. And then this the for the other things, and they so basically. And what and what you also can see is that the no, all right. I'll go back to this one here. So what you also can see is that the write amplification is basically the inverse of the performance. So if the application uh, the write amplification goes down, the performance goes up. Oh, surprise, surprise. We are using less bandwidth for the write application, so with more bandwidth for the writes themselves. Um, which also goes some fact, uh, some, uh, some steps to explain why we're having such a large fluctuation, because it's not only the IO which has to be written here, but also the amplification which we have to worry about, meaning the IO which is being written out and that drags down the performance, not only due to the bandwidth, but also due to internal locking. Because, well, um, you have to lock the zones um, such that you're not writing to zones which are currently written out. So, and here, so, right. So, and what we can see is that there's a direct correlation between performance and, uh, and performance degradation and write amplification. And, of, as mentioned, an inverse co a correlation between cache utilization and, and, and write amplification. And, um, the thing is that Reclaim really tries to run with a constant speed per disk, and um, but that's basically once it's high, it's above the low watermark. But once it's below the low watermark, it has to run at, at full speed, meaning it we do get some interaction between um, between the performance of the I/O and performance on the of the Reclaim. Yeah, and NUMA control, yeah, nice idea, but how can you NUMA control kernel threads, or rather work queue entries? That is um, the biggest problem here, because, well, you can schedule on a distinct CPU, but you cannot schedule your work queue entry on a CPU set, which is actually an interface I would like to have in these cases. But this doesn't exist. Maybe I'll just put it in. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, maybe I'll just put it in to see what, where we end up. So. And then, so um, what else? Um, what I would be like, to, uh, what what I would like to do. Um, the one idea was using DAX for metadata, because the testing I did so far with other uh, with other areas indicate that DAX is nice, but only for um, sub block access. So if you have data smaller than a block, then is uh, then this is where DAX really comes in. Otherwise. Um, the DAX performance actually goes down because it out of necessity can't really cache that easily as normal as normal uh, block access. 
And so it might give some improvements there. And then the other one is the mentioned newer effects. So we should be able to reclaim, uh, we should be able to um, restrict the reclaim workers on, on the CPU set. And also the other one is SMP call versus cache bouncing. Um, the one thing which I would want to look into what um, to figure out what would be more efficient. Because the problem is, what do we do if we get incoming I.O. from just the wrong CPU? So basically from a CPU which is on the other socket. How can, what would be most efficient to handle things? Would it be most efficient, uh, more efficient to um, reschedule that task to another CPU, which then runs on the same, on the correct socket? Or is it more efficient to incur cache bouncing and leave it running on that CPU? Um, this is something which needs to be investigated and well, if anyone has any idea how to investigate things, I'd be very grateful because that's something which, um, well, comes into play here and actually would, um, um, would be beneficial for other areas too, like for all the NVMe work we do and the automated interrupt affinity. So, so yeah. So one idea regarding this scheduling or, or idea, it's not really an idea, yeah. <laughs> I recommend. So, uh, you know, it, I believe it pretty much depends on the other workload that's on the machine, yeah? and that's the thing we observe with a lot of other benchmarks as well. So, obviously, it is advantageous to pull the task towards the CPU that has closer NUMA affinity to, to the storage, whatever the storage is, whether it is NVDIM or just the SAS controller or whatever. If the task is going to do enough I.O., which you don't know in advance, so it's always like predicting future, which is problematic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also depends on the uh, like general busyness of the other uh, of the CPUs due to other work and also like the other work the task does because it may be the IO is just affine to a single CPU but the RAM it is using is actually affine to the other NUMA node uh, and then in the end it works out best for the task to be at the other NUMA node and just you know bite the cost of the IO which is somewhat higher. So I guess there is really no, no good general answer to this because there are just too many variables and mm. like we could, we could always employ some heuristics like we do with the NUMA balancing. Uh, and Mel could tell you more about this. Mm -hmm. Like currently, it mostly involves only IO, uh, CPU and memory. Like there are trade-offs you have to do. Like IO is another parameter that adds to the, this or another dimension, let's say. Uh, and in principle, it's the same problem that simply you have to trade off somehow and you know, you can have heuristics which try to pull tasks where you think it's the best, but it's never going to be perfect. Like yeah. perfect is when you, when you have the application, you understand the use and then you just usually hand wire the setting, <laughs> like binding yeah, sure. the task to a node or whatever, which is actually what people usually do when they really care about the performance, like with the database tasks and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. So, and um, well, I'm more or less finished anyway. So, and clearly, one can always do some cache parameters to figure out running right? okay. um, to first um, scale with even more drives, figure out why I don't see the other half of all these disks, and um, look into reclaim throttling why it's being more efficient with the higher number of disks, and of course, the best parameters for these things. So, and yeah, the other thing which is missing is redundancy because currently there's none. Um, it should be able to implement some mirror-like functionality by just duplicating the setup. Um, and we could even do something like a declustered read as the, um, the zones being written have a mapping table already. So it doesn't really matter where we write them, which could help with the rate scenario here if we have two parallel sets of, of uh, of devices or of DM sound here, um, they could write to different areas. So if there is a read error or an, an I/O error on one side, we could easily just rewrite to another area and be happy with, and everything should continue to work. So with that, we could do some sort of declustered rate there. So and with that, I'm actually done. Thank you all for your patience about yet another SMR talk, but that was at least quite some interesting thing here.
So, and with that, I'd be open to questions, if there are any more questions. Yeah. Uh, there was some dis discussion about uh, what exactly is the sense of uh, host uh, managed uh, purely SMR disks in the uh, somewhere in the beginning. Uh, but uh, well, um, you, you're not so getting purely SMR disks is um, possibly not going to happen that e uh, that easily um, because. You, oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, because it's, um, you always will end up having to use some CMR zones. What they're implementing now is a way to convert zones. So, that's, I think there's, they even implemented a, a separate SCSI command for doing so, such that you can decide how many, um, dry, uh, how many zones should be CMR zones and how many zones should be sequential write zones. Um, so, if I'd be honored, yes, why not? Also, in the case of, of this cache, uh, disabled. And does it mean that there has been no flashes patches from the CMR or something like that? Hey, why would I not want to? There will be no flashes to printer for the, why not? So it really depends. Um, so of course, of course you can um, uh, you can have a di disk cache there. So that's completely that's from my perspective slightly orth orthogonal to whatever we talk. Um, sure, um, as soon as you have have a firmware on disk to a handling I/O, you have to ensure that this firmware is capable of sustaining a, a, a failure. Yes, sure, clearly. Um, so and with SME SSDs, yeah, we had this discussion, Anthony. Anthony, right? Um, you clearly have it if you want to um, have a data guarantee for SSDs. You do need to put in some more well hardware in the SSDs to ensure that you have a guarantee. And this is clearly not what you, what you get with your normal SSD with your normal SSDs because that's more hardware is making the SSD more expensive. And you only get this via the more expensive one. And there's actually a feature for it in this uh, for SSDs telling you whether this can support um, or whether these drives are hotplug capable or not. And I mean, there was this, we had the discussion, right? And for CMR, um, same, same thing hold, holds here. So, yes, you can implement flushes. And yes, you can implement a write cache because in the end it is some sort of a, uh, of a write cache. Um, but there's no uh, no gar no reason why you shouldn't expose things, or why you shouldn't expose the, the write cache and write cache capable to the OS and let them control via normal means. And then clearly, if you have flashes being being uh, for uh, being sent down from the OS, you would need to honor those flashes, which means you would need to write out your your cache data. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't really see a problem with that. Just drugs on the performance, clearly. So one question I have: so uh, if I so what you described, like the DM zone uh, scaling mm -hmm. and such like, that, sounds similar to me, like what B cache was aimed at. Yeah? So you have a cache device and then other slower devices which are used. And I even remembered some, that someone was looking into like uh, yes. using B cache to speed up access to SMR drives and stuff like that. So. Like, how does this compare? I assume, like, because it's hacking on Bcache is difficult or stuff like that, but I'm curious. So, um, no, 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 the problem is that Bcache um, works slightly different. Bcache is, um, um, not able to combine zones as you would need to do. So the whole idea why this one works is because we are, um, uh, the cache here is holding an entire zone, and it's basically caching uh, access to this zone, and then write out the zone at at, at as once. Uh, B cache has is coming from uh, from another side and just um, caching the blocks themselves and not so much the zones. So you would need to update B cache to make this to make this work, and. Um, even there, it's 
um, not easily possible to modify Bcash to work the same way with DM Sound. I actually talked about this with Cole, with Coley because he implement he tried to implement some work um, to make Bcash sound aware of being able to work with sound device, devices. But um, this wasn't it wasn't easily done because the transferring the sound um, characteristics over to the cache device turned out to be very tricky for um, for Vcache. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we are already five minutes over, so I would suggest if there are some more topics to discuss or some more questions to ask that uh, you might move into the discussions room. And we, so let's stop the recording. Thanks, Hannes. Thank you. Interesting talk.